that we have Deepal on a forum and not in on stage. <laughs> this is the first time I think he's coming that late. Uh, but I, I think he has a challenge. We missed the Buddhist element in the whole discussions. Uh, so is he going to contribute in that manner? And it, it is this, his event. So is he going to make the word of thanks? I don't know. So may I invite our Katha Nayaka, our beloved friend and guru, Mr. Deepal Suryarachi, to make the final thoughts of the day. Deepal, it is over to you. Gauraniya Mahasangratni Namasarai, members of the clergy, my dear friends, thank you very much for being here. Right? It's not easy to spend two hours after coming all the way to PIM. And Dimuthi kept on saying that all speeches are over. So he was giving me a message, Deepal, don't speak. So don't worry, I'm not going to speak. Because all the speakers said to read the book, read the book. So please buy the book and read the book. <laughs> uh, yeah, after all, uh, Sarasai publishers have made a big investment. So I don't have to worry about it. So please buy the book and read the book and gift it to others. That's how you can spread. First, I want to uh, connect a few dots and uh, finish this by 8.30. So I'll let you go. Now, when I think back while listening to all this, I was connecting a few dots in my life. And this book is part of that. You know, my father discussed Krishnamurti. I don't know how many of you have read Krishnamurti, J. Krishnamurti, when I was eight or nine years old. He told me about Krishnamurti. And in 1980, when my father died, on his third month almsgiving, in November, J. Krishnamurti was speaking in Kalamu at John the Silva. I changed the date of the Dani to be with there be at that event because I knew that is what my father would have done. So he got me interested. I come from a very remote village and my father made a Christmas tree out of a bamboo tree and explained what a Christmas tree and how to keep gifts. And he related me a story how his father, being a businessman, got into trouble while trying to protect his Muslim friends' businesses during the disturbance in 1920s, I think, very early time. 1915, 15. He just mentions these things. And uh, he always said, so he always taught me when he small time respect. Then when I, after my O levels, when I uh, was to come to Ananda College, and uh, I said I can't come to school from Horana, so he has to find a place now to stay. He meet one gentleman, Mr. Jaya Surya, and he gives a letter to one Mr. Bopitya. Now, this address is close to Ananda College, in the, uh, uh, behind uh, Asoka Vidya there. He goes to this house. And there is this Mr. Bopitya's father-in-law, who is a retired doctor, 70, 273 years old, and uh, he says, uh, I want to see whether my son can be boarded at your place. Now, by that time, this gentleman had refused his grandson to stay in that room, who was going to Nalanda. 
and later we became friends in the field of marketing. So by the time Mr. Bopidia returned home, this uh, gentleman had said yes to this unknown person because he doesn't know my father's friend. It is a different connection. When I went there, he started giving me little books of Buddhism in English. And he used to take, invite us to go with him to uh, Metta uh, Maitri Hall in uh, Timbirgasya, where there are English sermons. I think they're in there, but uh, we listen. And uh, that got me interested in Buddhism. And if not for that, it wouldn't have been possible for me to communicate with people of Goyos and Mishis and Papa Reinhardt's caliber at the age of 24. You, you heard the kind of stuff they talk, right? So at 24, I had to keep pace with them. And how this happened, there was a very distant relative family in closer to uh, Gampur. And you know, those days you don't go unless you have a relative to a part of the country, isn't it? So wherever you went, there must be a relative. And they say if you are a Sri Lankan, wherever in the world you will find whether there's a relative to stay. Even if the function is 100 miles away, you want to stay in a friend's place, isn't it? So we went to see Nuara Perehara from this far away place in Gampala. But I was the only one who continued relationship with this family. Not my other siblings, you know. They are relatives of relatives. So then when I went there, when that aunt died, when I went for the funeral, I came across this Olande Ananda Hampton. That's how that connection got. And as Dimutu said, he's the one who introduced Udita to me. And Udita and I didn't discuss management or marketing at that time. We discussed Krishna Muthi. And these, all these things, when I look back, there seems to be a pattern. And I was just thinking when I'm trying to put this book out, actually this was written quite some time ago. Uh, I think 2013, I did the final, first final draft. First final draft, I don't know if that is right. <laughs> because it's keep uh, going. And uh, then I was struggling to get this on. And uh, then I rang up uh, Professor Ajanta and said, you know, I have written a book like this. Uh, can I do it at uh, PIM Auditor? I was only going to hire the uh, hall, you know. But then he said, no, Deepal, we'll make it one of our events. And thank you very much for doing it. And I'm happy it happened this way. And I'm particularly thankful to you for coming. All these people have come through electronic invitations. No printed invitations. No personal invitations. By that time, over the phone. So this tells something that as a society we have evolved to accept electronic invitation is okay. So we have got very broad bands for electrical communi electronic communications, but we are becoming very narrow in our thinking. That's why I think this kind of narrative this kind of discussion is important. So how will you engage with this? You know Sibyl Vitta Singha, this famous children's artist. She once said a very beautiful story. There was a child. Now they have to draw a giraffe. Every time this child draws a giraffe, he paints it in blue. The teacher says, no, this is not blue. You have to put it in orange. So finally, this child drew it in orange and took the orange color giraffe 
on the paper and whisper to its ear, although the teacher says you are orange, you and I know this is blue, no? <laughs> I think that is the first level of interreligious engagement. All what you say is true, but my one is the best. So that is the first stage, it's okay, right? But I invite you to go through what happens to you because we tend to identify always ourselves with a bigger picture. We need a bigger identity. It may be the family at the beginning, it may be the school. We always think we have the best school. Uh, you know, I reminded uh, Reverend uh, Bishop also, you know, he was saying he's from a particular school. I said, yeah, I am from the better school, you know. So we have the <laughs> We have that going, you know, school is one identity. Then the religion also becomes a very good identity builder. We need some things. So in the TV interview I said the only business that thrives from religious uh, identity is the politics. Because you can create a block vote. That's why they want. This is strategy, you know. They are not interested in any religion. They want a block vote. So to get a block what you need some identity. So like that. So where this desire for identity comes, that's where the Buddhist approach illustrates. We think, we feel, we sense there's something called I. Like a solid thing. And we keep accumulating things that are enriching this whole identity business. So as long as we have this identity, there's division, I and you. So when you can shed little by little this identity, when you know there's no big deal, as Professor said, take the age of the universe, 60 years is nothing. When you realize this, when you are become, when you realize that you are free from this I, then there is no you, then there is only you. You are free. For me, that's what when Bible says those who are poor in spirit because when your ego is zero, you are poor in spirit. Now that's how I read that. That may not be the way a Christian would read. So I think this effort of ours will contribute to this evolution of human thinking. And we in Sri Lanka, we need to evolve into a modern nation. We can't build highways, skyscrapers, new cities, and be modern if we cannot think beyond our narrow, petty identities. So it is in that context, this effort of PIM inviting us to have this book reviewed or discussed today is important. It is in this need to change our narrative of getting into a modern nation. So I'm not going to speak on the Buddhist perspective of the dialogue because you are going to read it in the book. See, I'm back to my old job, selling. You have to buy it. <laughs> if you thought Deepal Ganga Haganyana, you can't, you have to read the book. Because anyway, I'm conscious that you want to go at 8.30. I have thanked everyone in my book, and especially my guests who have come all the way. Goyo, <coughs> he fought floods, and right now, his 97-year-old father-in-law is in hospital. <clears throat> Thank you.
and uh, his wife Indira sent him here. You know, his wife is the eldest uh, child of uh, this gentleman, and uh, it's a personal family risk Goyo took. And Mishi, coming all the way from Germany, he's just recovering from a fractured bone. And my invitation, willingly accepted, just by an email, and uh, Reverend Bishop Tichikera, such a beautiful contribution you made. And Sheikh, we have met only for five minutes, and uh, this is how it ended up. Thank you. And Bande, Mr. Bihari, and Naya Gahamburi, thank you. My Tamad, Mr. Jantuna. And uh, as Venerable Bishop said, uh, Sunetra needs uh, big recognition because <laughs> all these things is possible only because of <laughs> her. And I consider it a personal appreciation of you being here present. Thank you very much. Thank you.